Hello and welcome back to the studio. I'd like to introduce our panellists joining us today. Uh, to my immediate left, we have Deborah Elms, Executive Director of the Asia Trade Centre. Uh, Deborah is the founder and Executive Director of the Asia Trade Centre and is a regional thought leader, advocate and educator for trade in Asia. Uh, next to Deborah, we have Pradeep Nair, Global Head of Structured Solutions at Standard Chartered. Pradeep is responsible for strategy and leadership to grow structured and bespoke trade-based financing uh, solutions. He's also the lead for sustainable trade finance propositions. Thank you very much both uh, for joining us today. Before we get into the discussion, I'd just like to remind everyone uh, of the full biographies of our speakers and a selection of further readings on the topics uh, that you're hearing about today on the screen uh, under the media player. There's also a live Q&A segment and polling throughout this discussion. So please do send in your questions to us. Now uh, onto the panel. So um, let's just set the scene. We have 30 minutes to be looking at how we could be supporting SMEs within the region. I think if we uh, reflect on some of the learnings from the previous panel, there's a lot there that came up in terms of financing and down through those tiers as well. Uh, the application of technology, the incentives, the carrots and sticks that we could be using as well. Um, but Debbie, I know that you've done a, work, a, a lot of work with SMEs within the region, particularly around uh, trade. Um, just at the outset, just give us a, a sense of how important this section uh, of the um, uh, industrial structure within the region is to, uh, to Asia. The SME sector in Asia is a micro-small industrial sector. It's very, important in a it's very important globally, but it's particularly important here in Asia, where we have at least 90 and as high as 98% of all firms in the region are technically classified as micro-small and medium-sized. So if you can't get solutions that involve the, the vast majority of companies, then you have clearly missed an opportunity. Now, as we'll talk about, it, I think, a bit later, despite having an overwhelming number of small businesses, they don't always sort of punch above their weight. They tend to be a smaller percentage of overall output. But nonetheless, in terms of numbers of companies and jobs, crucially, SME sector is where the activity is, especially here in Asia. So if you want sustainable solutions, for example, you need to make sure that you figure out a way to filter this down to even the micro enterprises. Thank you very much. And, and Pradeep, again, just to get us um, uh, underway, how important then are, uh, is ESG um, uh, within SMEs to the goals of low, uh, large multinationals? How, how do we make that connection between the SMEs that we have in the region, the, uh, the ESG goals uh, of the multinationals? Yeah, so as Debbie said, 90, 98, 99% of the entities are SMEs, uh, contributing to around 40% of the GDP uh, of a region or a country. It's a massively important. It's massively important for the countries. It's massively important for the buyers. And we all know that the buyers are nothing but the big corporates mostly. There is always a lot of domestic consumption when it comes to MSMEs. There are restaurants and the others, but they are also the users of the products that is uh, catered to from a sustainable perspective. So um, if you want to source sustainably, you are potentially going to source from MSMEs in your chain. You are not going to be uh, doing it without it. So if you, and you also know, you've seen that in the last conversation that the scope three emissions are mostly in the supply chain. So if you want to get the ESG goals correct, as of a corporate for yourself, you need to make sure that your supply chain is ESG compliant and they are sustainable. Okay, so I'm going to move on to um, a, a further question, but just before we do that, I'm going to put out to the audience our first poll. Um, what is the single biggest bottleneck to sustainability and visibility for Southeast Asian SMEs in the supply chain? Lack of finance, a lack of data, lack of clear frameworks, lack of technological innovation, or a skills gap shortage. So please do have a look at that poll, uh, and we'll come back to that um, in, uh, in a session. Um, so uh, we understand how important SMEs are um, to the region in terms of uh, e uh, the economy and in terms of um, uh, working with multinationals as well, and, and the uh, crucial importance of visibility uh, within that is, uh, uh, as well. However, um, how well understood, how much of a driver is ESG within the region amongst these firms? How well is it understood? How well, how well is it implemented? I wonder if you could give us a sense of your understanding of that. Um, maybe Pratik, let me come to you. Um, uh, thank you. So 
I, I do believe that there will be nobody today who will not have an understanding of the importance of ESG, uh, at least in the recent past two years. Uh, prior to that, it was a buzzword possibly, but in the last two years, it's, it's, it's transformed itself. And everyone who is in any sphere of uh, businesses or even individuals uh, accept the fact that one needs to, uh, 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 you know, look at sustainable produce, uh, embrace sustainable business practices, uh, source sustainably, buy sustainably. So everyone is aware. The question is not whether they are aware or not aware. The question is, what are they doing about it? And what are the roadblocks for them to attain or achieve uh, sustainable practices? And that's the key question. Uh, to, if I want to address that question, it's, it's a whole gamut. Now, uh, the moment you are having to cater to a 90% audience, it's, it's a big volume. And the moment you cater to volume, you need standardization, you need simplicity, you need clarity. And that's the biggest uh, roadblock today. One of the biggest, I might say. And that means if someone needs to understand what is sustainable and what is sustainable trade or sustainable produce or sustainable goods, there need to be uniformity in the understanding, not only at the buyer level, but also at the supplier level and their sub-supplier levels, including the regulators, and the regulators also have uh, taxonomies now, and we, uh, we see it how important it is now to get harmonization of this taxonomy so that there is this clarity and standardization and therefore uh, simplicity in understanding. So that's the uh, biggest uh, roadblock today, if I may put so. And, and, and Debbie, on, on that point as well, we're, we'll come on to sort of dig into some of those roadblocks and challenges and how we can move forward uh, with those um, uh, um, uh, to, to uh, achieve some of the goals that, that, that we have. Um, but I wonder if you could just give your sense as well, how well understood, particularly as we go down from the, the, the bigger medium-sized enterprises to the smaller and the micro enterprises as well. Everybody's aware of ESG, but how much is it um, a business imperative at, at those uh, lower tiers? So we have a few companies that themselves are in ESG. They've discovered a market niche, they've gone out and they've done something about it. I think that's great. The problem is that for your average small business, there are a million things you need to worry about, and you have a very small number of people to do all of those things. And so I think, especially in Asia at the moment, for most micro and small enterprises, and for many medium-sized enterprises, ESG is part of a very long list and way down at the bottom of that long list. It's not that they don't want to be sustainable necessarily, or they don't care about it, or they're not worried about the planet or their children or whatever. It's that they don't have the capacity with the people that they have and the time and the resources to make it happen. And, and that's especially true as you get down from the, the medium-sized firms into the genuinely small and micro. Okay, and this can lead us into a discussion about, well, okay, these are the issues, what can we be doing about it, and where does the responsibility lie? But just before we get there, I did poll, uh, pose a question to, uh, to the audience there about what is the single biggest bottleneck to sustainability and visibility for Southeast Asian SMEs in the supply chain? And uh, I think uh, aligning with what you were just saying there, Freddy, 48% of you saying the lack of clear frameworks, 22% lack of technological innovation, and then 15% each for a lack of training, lack of finance. So it really does seem that um, the frameworks does, uh, uh, is a crucial component of this. However, it's not the only part, is it? So, so what's the role of uh, the trading partner, for example, the, the multilaterals, uh, in helping and supporting those um, small and medium-sized enterprises on their journey towards uh, ESG? I think there's a couple of things that you could helpfully do. I mean, obviously, the frameworks makes a difference, but then having, having a framework doesn't matter if you don't use it. So you'd have to ask, you'd have to say, this matters, and why does it matter? It matters because if I don't follow the frame, first of all, I have to know what it is. But once I know what it is, I have to follow it or I don't get financing. I have to follow it or I can't sell my products or I can't buy or whatever. There has to be a consequence to this. Um, and I think that requires a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. So it's not just creation of a framework which is occupying some people's attention. I think that's useful. But once you agree on a framework, let's imagine for sake of argument, it happened overnight. We wake up tomorrow, there's a framework. You have to get that information into the hands of millions of small businesses that would need to know about it in a way that makes sense to them and then have some consequence to them for using that framework. And I think those are some, again, not to say that this job is impossible, but it is, it's a time-consuming process. And Pradeep, if I could come to you then on, on that same question about 
you know, the roles of different actors with progressing that ESG agenda with, with SMEs. Everyone was just talking there about, I guess, education and making sure people are aware of what the frameworks are in the first place. But what other roles for other actors do you see? Um, so I, I agree with Debbie. So it's just that having a framework doesn't help. Uh, but the fact is that also today that our corporates are insisting on sustainable uh, suppliers uh, and sustainable producers to be uh, sold to them. And they, they lack the infrastructure today uh, in many ways. One way is, uh, is the clarity and the guidance they require. Of course, uh, the A supplier may not be catering only to one uh, uh, you know, buyer, they may be catering, catering to multiple. And each buyer may have a criteria for themselves as to what is sustainable, and hence that creates complexity and cost implication for our clients, right? So that's one. Second is the sourcing itself. Uh, it, it's not that everything can be sourced sustainably today. Uh, there is uh, uh, no substitute for some items, and we need to make sure, we need, we need to recognize that fact. We need to see how to move uh, therefore from a non-sustainable to slightly more sustainable and then move to more green so that will be the transition pathways that we'll have so, so that's the other part understanding where how uh, we need to move the third more important is the cost now i know the previous panel discussed about this cost and this cost was to be borne by the uh, entire chain uh, more so by the buyer at the end of the uh, chain because they are the one who's paying for it and that but till, till the time that's paid, uh, someone has to fund it. Someone has to uh, you know, uh, pay it today. Today, that's the second biggest bottleneck. And I can see in the poll question, it's, it's, it's about 15% of importance. Uh, but when it comes to actual uh, you know, SMEs, if you talk to them, and even if you talk to the big corporates, the biggest question they say is, how can you fund my suppliers? Mm -hmm. And uh, banks are addressing that. And banks are addressing that largely in the post-shipment side. And that's great. Uh, it's not fully there. Uh, there is still some way to go, even at the portion side. The deep tier financing that uh, Kai mentioned that we do in the bank is great, and uh, I think uh, solutions that we like that will help uh, increase uh, the post shipment financing for the supply chain, including the suppliers. But more importantly, uh, financing also required at the pre-shipment level, at the production level, at the sourcing level for these suppliers and the suppliers below them. And that's where the uh, issue starts coming up. And if you see the gap in financing, the 1.7 trillion that people are quoting, or maybe even bigger, this is where that gap is. And it's not that people don't like to finance it. Uh, people look at the risk of it, and they do not have a mechanism to accept that risk today. And uh, you know, even corporates, even uh, the anchor buyers need to be able to accept that risk in some form. And not only the financing institutions, it is important that we work together to find a solution. So in that light, if you speak of who are the actors who play into this, it is the corporates who buy, it is the uh, financing entities like us, uh, it is the DFIs who can help alleviate some of the risk issues. And we, it, it is only with the collective effort of all can we make this come to a fruition, which today it's not at the pressurement level? So, so sort of moving on uh, from that point or, or building on it, do we have any examples from, a, from across the region here in, in Southeast Asia, governments, corporate, civil society coming together to help this drive for sustainability within particularly the, the, the smaller and medium sized exports? Anything come to mind? You had a good example earlier of a pilot project. I think you should share that. Yeah, I won't share the name, but uh, uh, just for confidentiality purpose. But then we are working with a client of ours in uh, financing a supply chain uh, or, or on the deeper tier at a pre-shipment level itself. And here, you know, earlier when we used to uh, speak to our clients and clients used to demand of us, why don't you fund our supplies at a pre-shipment level? It was our risk. We needed to accept the risk. Yes, we are in those markets. We understand those supplies better, so we should be ideally able to accept the risk, but the risks are quite high. So uh, at points, we may not be able to accept. Uh, now the discussion is very different. They are willing to partner with us, uh, take the po a portion of the risk, and put their skin in the game, uh, and that helps us. We're working with DFIs on this uh, to come together along with us, to give us the, uh, you know, a, a wrap or a benefit of it to some extent, and then we are working to uh, fund that whole project. Uh, that's on the pre-shipment level. Uh, at the post-shipment level, we already seen benefits coming through. We're seeing a lot of financing happening, even at the COVID stage, right? When a lot of suppliers had to uh, had disruption in their supply, you know, in their production process, where the employees were not there, the they were clogging in the ports where the ships were not moving around. Um, there were uh, financing gaps, and that we've seen the anchors, the buyers, the MNCs coming to, they're rallying together and willing to accept that risk and pay for those storage period and financing period. So it's all a brilliant example of how things are changing and uh, how people are coming together to help 
the SMEs uh, in the regions. And, and Debbie, maybe if I could just bring the focus on to Singapore, as we know SMEs are a crucial component of the economy here. What type of forums do we have where SMEs, where government, where other actors are coming together and sharing their concerns and trying to f find um, uh, ways forward? That's a good question. Um, I, one of the advantages of Singapore is its model is meant to be where we bring together business with government with, we, we don't call it NGOs necessarily, but at least with um, you know, other actors, labor workers, et cetera, mm -hmm. and try to create a, a holistic approach to dealing with these issues. Um, that's been happening, and I think that's very useful. So the gathering of information is an example from various chambers of commerce, whether they're domestic chambers of commerce or international ones trying to bring in the smaller businesses. One of the problems that Singapore has, like everyone, is how do we get a hold of small businesses? Where are they? How do you get them to come to something? How do you get them to participate? And if you get them in the room, how do they, how do they join in? Because often one of the problems of having, especially a government to, to smaller businesses discussion, is they speak past each other. You know, that happens with government, it happens with banks. I'm sure we have a number of small businesses on the line who frankly didn't understand much of what you said because, not because it wasn't articulate, but because the language of finance and banking is very different from the daily language of smaller businesses who are, you know, trying to create, uh, you know, a new water bottle. Like, that's what they're focused on. And so you have gaps in how we communicate. And, and I don't think that Singapore has done a worse job than anyone else. It's just, it's a hard conversation to have. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully today's uh, discussion will help uh, move our agenda forward there as well. Okay, um, so we've got a, a few questions um, uh, coming in and maybe we can t take one of these. Um, uh, so to, to, to both my, um, uh, my guests today, should SMEs in non-developing countries use the same tools and assessment reporting as those in um, uh, developing countries. I think that should be, should SMEs in non-developed or developing economies use the same as those in uh, developed economies? If so, what would be the implications for SMEs then? Um, uh, so this is going back to standards and harmonizations and, uh, and frameworks and so on, something that we'll dig into in the, in the next panel as well. But that gap between stages of development, how, how, do we measure, how do we manage that, and particularly here within the region? It's massive. You know, so one of, the, one of the worries that I have about a sustainability agenda driven particularly by Europe, potentially North America, is you develop standards that are European-focused, mm. that allows a small business in Europe to participate will be impossible for many or all or most of the small businesses in Asia to participate in. So a buyer who is faced with two small businesses, one in Europe and one not in Europe, will, I think, divert to the, the European one. Because the European one will be able to comply, will understand the regulations, will have incentives that an Asian competitor will not have. So my worry with this focus on sustainability not that, of course, that I don't want sustainability, but the potential for carving out large parts of the Asian small business community and medium-sized business community because they're not aware of and they can't meet, especially European standards. I think that is a real risk that we need to think about. And, and how do we level up Asian small businesses? That's much harder. I mean, there are millions of them, literally. Uh, and how do we convince European buyers and regulators and people who are developing these standards that they need to be flexible in the way in which they're developed to not carve out the developing economies from participating? Mm. And Pradeep, on that, how do you help your clients navigate that particular challenge that Debbie was enunciating there? Um, thank, uh, yeah, I, I don't disagree with what Debbie is saying in terms of how it could potentially affect. Uh, but if you look at uh, the suppliers, ASEAN in Asia um, is the bedrock of supply chain. That's where most of the produce go into, whether it's a raw material, whether it is a manufacturing process or stuff. Design-wise, technology-wise, process-wise, I think there is no lack in understanding. So whether it is the current sustainable procurement as well, it still is done from a lot of these Asian SMEs itself. Uh, that by itself should be less of a concern, but yes, the production process that gets involved and the uh, emission standards that come along with it and the carbon footprint that comes along with it, that's where the challenge lies, yes. And also, to some extent, the labor standards that come along with it because that's how the economy is. And we realize that 
it can't change overnight. Uh, you can't say that you can't use coal fire plants overnight in this country, for example, where coal fire is 90% or 80% of what is used for electricity generation. We realize, and uh, as long as we can transition from that to a more sustainable source in a agreed period, and that's fine. So from a sustainable sourcing point of view, we, we, what we do is we work with clients on two forms. One is sustainably sourced goods from a farm or a produce from an agri-commodity perspective. So that's fair, that's fine. Then comes when it comes to production processes, we work on a transition framework with our clients where we help them transition from a non-sustainable business practice to a sustainable business practice. Yes, we realize it's not easy. Uh, it will take time and we want to help them. Uh, we, get, we give financing for that. Um, and that's where financing is also required in a big way. Um, so that's one of the ways to do it. And just on that point of yeah. that transition, which seems to be crucial, yeah. what sort of time frames are we looking at? Is, is it years? Is, is it months? When, when you're talking about some of the, the, the smaller suppliers, the tier, say, three or four, um, how much time are they given to, to transition? There is no one single answer for this. Sure. Uh, there's no regulated answer for this. Let's just be clear on that. So each, uh, it, will all, it all depends on two things. One is uh, what a corporate, a buyer is uh, in, you know, regulating themselves towards because they all put standards out on what they will achieve by 2030, 2045, 2050, uh, along with uh, uh, on lines of NZBA or other uh, things which they have signed up to. So it will be dictated by that in part. It will also be dictated by in part by the financing institutions and what standards do they have uh, as to when, they, what can they finance and to what, what period they can finance uh, less sustainable business practices. Um, so it's not easy, but the fact is it will not be overnight and it cannot be overnight. It will be over a period of time. I think our uh, supplier base, our client base understands that. They're all asking us and asking questions of how we can achieve it. It's not only financing issues, there's also technology issues of how we will move and get the technology to do it. Uh, what help can be sought and what will be provided? Who all will come to help them, including the DFIs? So we, as a bank, uh, we bring all of that together for our client when we go into a discussion and help them not only understand what is required, but what will be the steps required and what will, how will we help them achieve this over a period of time? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, sort of looking forward a, a, a little bit more, where, where, where do you see some glimmers of hope when you're interacting with, with SMEs, when you're, you're hearing about uh, examples of them working with bigger multinationals and you know, sort of upgrading and going through that transition that Pr Pradeep was talking about? Where do you see um, some, some real grounds for optimism in terms of you know, upgrading SMEs within the region? So I think there's a couple of things I would say. One is, one is that we have businesses that are launched specifically for sustainable reasons, right? So they come in with an idea that is all about sustainability first and foremost. They identify a gap. They say, I can provide these goods, these raw materials, or we haven't really talked about services, but these kinds of sustainable services or supporting infrastructure services. Uh, and I think that is a market that is growing and that will help. So we'll have small businesses that are literally born to be in this space. I think that's very useful. Um, and as these lead firms require more and more compliance from their suppliers, you will get some of that trickling down, of course. It will take time. Right now, it's mostly at the medium-sized firms because m small firms, by and large, don't participate in supply chains in the same way. Or if they do, they're not even aware that they're part of a supply chain because they're so far <laughs> down the chain. You know, They are developing... Um, I don't know what, some small percent, for example, some kind of agricultural product that they provide that ultimately ends up in somebody's, you know, baby food that goes someplace else. They didn't even realize they were part of a chain, you know, or they produce some kind of small component, you know, buttons for shirts or something. Uh, and, and to get those guys into a supply chain and realize that they're part of this supply chain, I think is hard because that's, that's, that's a, there's a, and there's a lot of things that they have to worry about. Again, I would say sustainability matters. But there's a lot of other compliance concerns that businesses have, basic trading issues. How do I get my goods from where they are to where they need to be? How do I find markets and how do I find buyers? How do I manage this complicated customs regime? How do I deal with tax problems that are increasingly a nightmare? I mean, there's a lot of issues that smaller businesses have to worry about if they trade, of which sustainability is one thing that is moving up the agenda, but still a challenge for firms. Mm -hmm. 
Mm, yeah. I'm, I'm proud of on, the, on that same point. So looking at, over, over the past few years, we've had an increasing focus on, on, on ESG issues. We've also had COVID, and uh, we were hearing in the previous panel about you know, how that's pushed um, or, or progressed some of the agendas and, and made us realize uh, that we need to have better visibility around supply chains and so on. But if you look out over the next uh, few years, what would you say is coming up on your agenda? Where would you say are some of the most um, uh, it, valuable and interesting areas to be working with SMEs on, on this issue of supporting them with their journey towards a more sustainable future? So uh, we had run a research report um, called Carbon Dated uh, as a bank. And what we figured out in that research is that uh, there will be suppliers who will not be part of a supply chain for bigger corporates in a period of time because they cannot be supplying to them. And to me, that's a big risk. And if we don't work with them, and if these suppliers don't change their business practice, then it's a problem. And obviously, naturally, that is a natural progression of how corporates evolve. But uh, in general, I think uh, people realize this change of what sustainability is bringing. And it's not just a buzzword. It is actually existential in some point in time. Mm. So all these other issues of which is very real for SMEs uh, when it comes to processes, business practices, the tax issues, the compliance issues, which they will have to do in any case. But if they can't produce, a sus produce good sustainably, then they will not have a business to manage. Mm. And to me, that is going to be the forefront of how uh, things will pan out and the transformation that we will see in the supply chains. So, um, Debbie mentioned a couple of times the, uh, the, the word holistic. Is that yeah. something that you uh, agree with? It's really a, a holistic approach that brings in all the different actors, uh, from financing from producers to uh, governments and civil society. Um, but do you see evidence of that emerging here within the region? Yes, of course. Uh, absolutely. So, you know, as I said, it, a few years back, it was difficult for you to have a discussion with anyone and say that I need you to come with us and uh, partly take the risk away or fund me at a cheaper cost or put in uh, standards or regulations uh, so that people understand what is to be done. Uh, you've seen in the past couple of years a lot of countries uh, and the regulators in those countries or industry bodies coming up with standards. It's one of the uh, ways in which they are contributing towards bringing clarity and transparency because they want the uh, suppliers or clients in their economy to be competitive, to remain uh, in the business. So they've done that. We speak to uh, DFIs. They're very keen. They've always been keen to work with the developing countries, so that's helpful. And they're particularly focused now also to work on green uh, you know, economy, mm. uh, where we have less uh, carbon also, or where we make impact on the sustainability side, on the social side. So there is that involvement now, which is direct. There is involvement with uh, investors. Now, there are a lot of investors who want to invest in sustainable business practices. Mm. Uh, prior to a, a few years back, that was not the case. Now, what does that mean? It means you can access liquidity and you can access that at a cheaper cost, uh, which means the cost of financing for a sustainable business practice is, is going to go down compared to someone who's not going to be sustainable. Uh, so that's where, that, it's direct proof. We are seeing it uh, every day, and the impact of this is actually going up every day. Excellent, good, good. Um, so we've got a, a couple of minutes left. I'd like to turn our attention to, to the future a little bit. And um, the title of this panel was, you know, how can we support SMEs? So, Drawing on your experience of working, you know, with that set or those um, those players in in that sector, what would you say would be the the one thing that um, uh, people like Standard Chartered or uh, large multinationals looking to do business here in the region? What's the one thing that they could really focus on to support SMEs? Money. <laughs> <laughs> Small businesses always need more money. You know, I, this is moving from whatever your traditional practices are into something more sustainable. Cost money. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of competing demands on your time and your, and your limited resources. So having more access to money of, of whatever kind makes a big difference to a small business. Mm. Um, and if it's not available, it will be very hard for many small businesses to transition. And they may find themselves cut out of some supply chains, but I, at least in the near term, medium term, they may not lose their business entirely because there are people who will, don't care about sustainability, or they do, but they don't really, not when they go to buy something. And so it's not that you have to be sustainable necessarily. You could continue to exist for some period of time less sustainably, and you might actually make plenty of money doing it. So I think we have to think hard about the incentives for individual firms. Mm. You know, they will do things 
that they would like to do, but, but ultimately it costs money. Do I want to pay my staff or do I want to be sustainable? You know, a lot of firms will say, thank you, I'll pay for my staff. Mm. So, Pradeep, on, on that point again of, of support, um, money uh, was, was, was Debbie's uh, answer there, um, but you uh, already um, uh, drew attention to you know, greater liquidity around sustainability and so on, but um, uh, money is just one thing, there are other incentives, how else can, can we help and support uh, SMEs in, in a practical way? So the, I'll just go a step back, so before you help, you really need to know what is it that they're looking to be helped for. Mm. Uh, and the fact is, and I will say that, this, the help they will look for is how do they continue running a business, which is yeah, for a longer term. And if there is opportunity to run a business without being sustainable, there is nothing to do. Uh, they can still run the way they are, and that's fine. But I don't think that's going to be the case, uh, for a, at least very soon. Yep. Um, there will be still some pockets where that can happen, but that's fine. But largely, there is a big change happening and people will want to run business. So when they want to run business sustainably, and as we spoke about, things that they will require is one, knowledge of what needs to be done uh, from a supply perspective. That is what the buyers will tell them. I want to have, uh, you to supply me with A, B, C standards, these goods. So that's fine. To produce that, where do they source from? I think they're the best judge. They can find sourcing from various places, but then, if we have a database uh, in a country of, so, uh, of sorts where you can uh, know where you can source sustainably, that will help them because it will uh, be easy for them to go and get mm. those producers. Third, when it comes to uh, production practices, uh, social practices, uh, there are you know, banks like us, there are other people in the economy who can actually help them, guide them to move their business practice from less sustainable to more sustainable. So they will need help with all of this. Yes, all of this will cost money at the end of the day. Nothing gets done without money. Yep. Uh, uh, but uh, the fact is that money is going to be paid by the sale that they're going to generate. Yep. But the question is, do they have to have a sale or do they continue with the current practice? That's where the question is. Okay, thank you very much. We are unfortunately at time. Thank you very much for all of those insights and asking the questions and the questions from the audience uh, as, as well. Um, it, it seems to me that there's a lot of progress that's been done. There's a lot of um, uh, uh, roadway for us to be progressing that sustainability ESG uh, agenda within the region, some very practical ways in which we can be helping uh, SMEs, that crucial component of uh, economic structures, not just here in Singapore, but uh, elsewhere uh, in, in the region and, uh, and beyond. So thank you very much uh, uh, for that. Um, just to our audience, there is a uh, post-event survey that's embedded in the media player. Please click Submit Your Feedback button. Uh, your feedback is highly appreciated. It will help us improve on future events. Uh, and with that, um, uh, thank you to Deborah Elms and Pradeep Nair. Thank you very much. Thank you.